John. Mm. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that in uh, Europe that Miles Davis is known as Kilometer Davis? <laughs> uh, yeah, why not? 2.2. 2. <laughs> Don't patronize me. Oh, we're oh uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of the Differently Wired Show, episode 55. Uh, what are we doing? Oh, how to be fun. That is the main topic. Uh, my name is Max Danger Derrett, your friendly neighborhood Simpsons kin. And uh, I just want to say, before I introduce my guest, F. Warner Brothers. That's, I'm not going to, well, I'll, maybe I'll explain <laughs> that later. But uh, besides that point, um, joining me as always, he is uh, PhD, he is... Uh, you know, when Young talks about the archetypes of the wise man, he is, uh, the, you know, he was referencing John when he was talking about that. Uh, he is John Tucker, PhD. Hello, John. What's going on? Hello, Max. How are you this evening? Uh, well, you know, just uh, trying to make a living on YouTube, trying to upload videos. And then suddenly, when I try to uh, upload a video on Joker... Uh, almost instantaneously, Warner Brothers is like, nah, because you, uh, you had a... They, say, they said the, the joke's on you, right? Yes, the just, exactly. They say you get what you uh, effing deserve, and then they blow my brains out on national TV. But you'd only get that if you actually saw the movie, so I, I don't know why I made that joke. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit frustrated. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, thankfully, I got the video done early, so I'll probably release sometime tomorrow, even though I said it would release on friday but uh that's besides the point let's just um let's just get some stuff out of the way first the usual stuff uh let's see what do we have here uh let me just get back into the groove get my mind off of uh, demonetization first of all we do have an audio version of the differently wired show finally uh i know you guys have been asking for it for a while but it is finally here we went uh, a few different audio versions went live a couple weeks ago, we have it on Apple, we have it on Spotify, and even though I don't have the graphics for it uh, right now, we are also available on Stitcher, on uh, Google Play, and we actually just got approved for mm -hmm. iHeartRadio. So uh, feel free to um, go and, download and, and, a, and a partridge in a pear tree. And a partridge in a pear tree. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't mind that. That'd be a nice gift from uh, these people because, you know, we're benefiting them. They're not benefiting us. Um, that's not true. Um, but yeah, if you guys want an audio version of the Differently Wired show, uh, it's free. So feel free to uh, go and download load, uh, that if you so please. Next, Discord server. We do have one. Hey, John, guess what? You got more than 10 people. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, just one step on my pride here. No, uh, joke's on you. We actually hit 1,000 subscribers. I knew it. Damn it. I'm trying to have... I was going to have a... Oh, there we go. <laughs> and I'm going to turn that off before this stream gets demonetized, but I just felt it was appropriate. Goddamn phone. When I press play, you're supposed to play. But yes, we did hit 1,000 subscribers. Uh, subscribers. Uh, members of the Discord server. I'm so proud of all of you. I can't believe we actually made such a significant milestone. Uh, and understandably so. Because, <clears throat> uh, you know, the Discord server, everybody for the most part says that it's a wonderful place to go. Calm, welcoming, and uh, very helpful to people that are currently suffering with mental health issues and issues related to autism. So if you haven't joined the Discord server yet and uh, you want to you know, interact with like-minded people, maybe talk to some people about stuff that's on your mind, get stuff off your chest, now's the time to go. So click on the link in the description box below if you'd like to join. And also, speaking of the Discord server, I just wanted to mention also that uh, we are looking for new members of the support squadron. These are the people that you message if you need somebody to talk to. They're available uh, to talk to you. That's why they're members of the support squadron. Their names are... Wait, why does it look like that? That's weird. Uh, anyways. Oh, that's because... Okay. 
Never mind. Yeah, the, if you want to be a member of the support squadron, uh, you can just volunteer. You can uh, email me or you can direct message me on the Discord server if you'd like to volunteer. There are certain perks that are going to be available very soon for uh, the pre-existing members of the squadron and new members that will be joining. So uh, you might want to talk to me now if you want to get those perks. Um, and yeah, if you just want to contribute to making the world a little bit better, uh, make somebody's day uh, a little bit less miserable, uh, please just let me know. Oh, excuse me. I uh, I had pasta and sausage before dinner, uh, before doing the show. Um, so, actually, you know what? We did decide before we started the show, John, that we weren't actually going to jump right into the main topic for today's show. We were actually going to jump into the mailbag because we do actually have a decent number of uh, mailbag to get through today. So, um... Yeah, we're going to do that. So just uh, in case you guys don't know what Mailbag is all about, every week, uh, if you know we have a Mailbag to uh, draw from, we go into my email, we pick out some of the emails that you guys are sending us, whether it's uh, you know, you're asking us to talk about a certain topic, maybe you have a question, maybe you, you want to uh, tell a story about your life. We'd like to hear from you so that way you can uh, contribute to the conversation. It's not just John and I uh, hogging up all the airspace. So if you want to send in anything like that, all you have to do is send it to uh, this email address that you see on screen right now, which is maxterrett at yahoo.ca. So first email comes to us from a regular contributor to this show, Darth Escar 98 and uh, oh, just before I start, I just want to remind you guys, I haven't read these emails beforehand. I just uh, copy and pasted the contents into Photoshop. So I'm actually reacting to this as I read them. First off, Garth Escar writes, Hey, I'm probably on the spectrum and throughout my life, I've had numerous issues fitting into different groups of people, as many on the spectrum do. After thinking about some relatively recent experiences, I've considered that I might be thinking incorrectly about what fitting in actually is. For example, it's theoretically possible to fit in well with a group of people if you're highly different from them because of the potential for differences to be complementary. Yeah, uh, maybe there's something about fitting in which people tend to think about in the wrong ways. For me, this seems like the issue of knowingly doing something wrong, but having no clue of what the right way is. Oh, and that's uh, the end of the email. Thank you very much for sending that in, Darth Eskar. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, what I have found personally, you know, trying to uh, appeal to people with my lack of social skills and my social awkwardness is sometimes you do try to fit in with the wrong people. Uh, when I was younger, I found that unfortunately, some of the wrong people that I was trying to fit in with are the people that say, oh, yeah, we're all for inclusiveness of people that are uh, socially awkward or socially deficient. Uh, but they tend to be the uh, uh, there's unfortunately a tendency for some of those people to be uh, just declaring that they uh, support uh, the socially deficient people. In other words, uh, they're the people that speak rather than actually do. Uh, so I feel you there. But there are, uh, you know, it, it is hard to differentiate between people like that, people that you can fit in with, uh, people you can't. Uh, John, um, just, when you've tried to uh, help people out, uh, trying to figure out what are the better groups to try to go after and which ones to avoid. What, like, uh, would you suggest to Darth Eskar? Well, uh, fitting in is a, a huge problem if you're differently wired. Uh, and what can happen is that you might spend too much energy in figuring out ways to fit in and forgetting about what works for you. Mm. So... It's good to know yourself as as well as you can, know what you like to do. So in terms of fitting in, it's not the kind of group, but rather a group that actually um, measures up to your values. So in, a, in other words, instead of fitting in with that group because they do this, you can say, wait now, I want a group that fits me. <laughs> so it's a, it's a kind of a different way of looking at it. So if you, for instance, now a lot of people who do ADHD, Love to climb rocks. I, I'm not sure exactly why. I have a theory, but I'm long to stay here. But they love rock climbing. So you're going to find yourself fitting in with other people who like that. It, it's very simple minded. But we forget in our effort to try to minimize how bad we feel about not fitting in, we try working on fitting in instead of finding what fits us. So I 
I think turning it around a little bit. And, you know, if you find a group doing something or having an interest that you're not interested in, you should don't try to fit in. You know what it just while you're saying all that, John, it sort of reminded me of what that uh, Color Is Your Parachute book has been trying to preach to me. Because <laughs> John, oh, yeah, yeah uh, d- well, just before I explain what I've been doing with it, John, do you sort of just want to remind people what what Color your, Is Your Parachute is? Oh, yeah, it's a book that I love to use. The writer has passed away. He passed away at about 90. He wrote the book every year for I don't know, 30 or 40 years, Richard Bowles. And what he does is help people find how they fit in. Where, they, where their interests lie. And what he does in this book is get you to identify what matters to you, what direction you want to take. Then you take that knowledge of self and apply it where it fits outside. In other words, you don't see, oh, daddy is this kind of uh, job, so I must fit in and be like daddy or mommy. That's actually not a good thing. It might work sometimes by a fluke, but sometimes it won't work at all. The parachute takes the opposite way. Assess yourself, look at your values, look at your interests, look at the kind of people you like to be around, look at the place you want to live, look at how much money you need to make to be happy. Uh, Look at all that stuff. Then see what fits you, as opposed to you, you know, jumping into some workforce, not having any idea how you got there and saying, oh my God, I've just spent seven years studying and working to do this thing. And I hate it. Mm -hmm. I've actually known quite a few people who've done that. Like they've worked really hard. They got a career. They graduated from law school. And I wake up one morning and say, I don't want to practice law. I don't want to do it. (laughs) And so it's the fitting, you know, the fitting in is exactly wrong. So parachute, helps you avoid that stuff by getting a fix on where you need to go, where you want to be effective, then you pick your career. So that's the parachute process. Yeah, it's and I it's sort of it seems obvious when you actually hear about the process that this is obviously the preferred route to go down because uh, but oddly enough, it doesn't uh, occur to us and including people like me, but uh, I've actually been uh, trying to look for other avenues of uh, revenue beyond uh, what I'm doing right now with YouTube and my other job. And John recommended that I use the what color is your parachute method. And so far, you know, it's it's kind of uh, interesting. It's kind of reassuring, you know, just uh, by making the self inventory, figuring out what your skills are, what you like to do. You can start by learning, OK, how can I make myself valuable? How can I make myself attractive to um, employers? And uh, I could figure out what classes I might need to take, uh, like the more effective methods of job searching. And uh, just by doing that and feeling productive by doing that, it's actually made the whole burden of job hunting a lot less uh, uh, agonizing and a little bit more interesting. So maybe try applying uh, some of that to you and trying to figure out how to socialize with people and trying to figure out which groups to fit in with by making yourself um, more uh, like feeling valuable, trying to figure out that, you know, sorry, I'm sort of all over the place tonight, guys. I apologize. Please just bear with me. By trying to make yourself uh, realize that you are valuable and figuring out what parts of you are attractive and that you can build upon, you can start bringing people to you instead of trying to uh, figure out how to um, go after them yourself. Like for me, it was like music. It was uh, my weird sense of humor. That was me in high school and somewhat to this day. And, uh, you know, I'm doing YouTube videos. I've been able to gather a community of people that are like me and, uh, you know, uh, be able to talk to you guys every day in the Discord server. So if you need any help with that, uh, Darth Eskar, make sure to uh, email us back again so that way we can continue the conversation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Athena, goddess of wisdom and warfare, sends in a $2 super chat. Thank you very much for that. And he says, virtue signaling. I know that all too well. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the proper term for what I was referring to before about people that say, oh, uh, we express solidarity with uh, the disenfranchised, the, the mentally ill, and the socially awkward. And then when it comes time, like when you go up to them and say, hey, can you be my friend? Like, oh, get away from me, loser. You know, <laughs> that's what the virtue yeah. signaling is. So, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's the clinical term for it. Thank you very much, Athena. All right. 
<clears throat> Moving on to the next email. This one comes to us from Chuck Miller. And Chuck Miller writes, Hi, Max. I found your podcast through Jacob Below, the illustrator for my children's picture book, Will Little Rue Ever? Oh, that that was the... Um... Oh, yeah. But Jacob, Jacob sent in an email last week telling us he was the illustrator for that book. And we brought it up on mm-hmm. the screen, yeah. Okay, a fr- cool. A-, a friend of mine who also graduated from Kubert School introduced me to Jacob. He's a fabulous illustrator and really brought my words to life. I'd be willing to donate 20 to 30 signed copies of the book for you to distribute to children and their families who are touched by different abilities. Shoot me a message if you're interested. Chuck Miller, we're interested. We're Great interested. Idea. Absolutely interested. I, uh, yeah, I know a whole bunch of people uh, that I could send those books to that would love them. They have kids that are uh, differently wired themselves. Uh, yeah. Uh, John. Yeah, it, I can help. I can help out with that. If you know, postage is an issue or some administrative stuff, uh, be happy to do that. And people who are interested, you know, can be from anywhere. doesn't matter. And we don't have a rubric of checking things out. The people in this community are trusted. So if you tell us, you can use the book or you have a child or a child, you know, whatever, that's fine. You just send them out. Mm, yeah. And if, you know, anybody that's listening right now, you guys ha- have any kids or uh, that are differently wired or struggling with them? Or, with- or, or nephews or nieces, you know, that would benefit. Yeah. You know? pl- please just uh, feel free to let us know by sending us uh, an email to the aforementioned email address or message me on Discord or on Twitter. Yeah. We'd, uh, Chuck Miller, thank you so much for... Uh, uh, offering to do that we'd love to be able to because that book just looked absolutely adorable and uh we'd love for it to be successful i love the i love the spirit of that book the inclusiveness and the uh the the approach of normalness mm. that uh, uh is is rather rather encouraging for a young child to grow up with so La- lady paint says max's humor is great well god bless you <clears throat> All right. Uh, thanks so much, Chuck. Uh, we'll get into contact with you uh, shortly. And then finally, our third email comes to us from Valentina. I love that name. And Valentina writes, Hello, Max. I've been having some troubles to communicate that really affect me. I'm in my 20s, diagnosed about a year ago. The thing is, I've been in a relationship for a bit more than a year. It seems to me that all the problems that we've had have been because of the difficulty that I have sometimes with communication. Sometimes I feel like I cannot talk. Sometimes I do not have the words to say what I feel or think. That usually happens because I get overwhelmed. It usually is really comprehensive. I understand that it can be difficult to him to deal with it sometimes. He occasionally feels like I have a dependency on him, because when I cannot talk and I am overwhelmed, I'm also pretty static, and it's harder for me to make decisions. He feels like he has to take care of me and make all the decisions for me. I completely understand his concern, even though I do not think I have a dependency on him at all, and I think that if he doesn't do that for me, I'll eventually clear up and be fine. I told him that, but the fear doesn't go away. I am not sure what I am looking for by sending this. I am not sure what to do with it, but I do not want to make him feel like he has to take care of me as if I was a little girl that needs somebody else to survive. I read once that females on the spectrum tend to be kind of obsessed with their partners. Is this true? I apologize if there are writing errors. I know, I hope it is readable. Yeah, it was for the most part readable, Valentina. Thanks for sending that in. Um, I I want to throw this over to John first, but before I do, I just want to address that last thing you said. Um, as far as females on the spectrum tending to be obsessed with their partners, I I've, I've never heard anything about that. Um, I I if there's any sort of obsession with one's partner while you are on the spectrum, I would just imagine that would be, it wouldn't be a female thing. It'd just be a, a autistic thing because, you know, you tend to have <clears throat> these very specific areas of interest uh, that you tend to focus in on. You tend to hyper-focus in on. Um, so I don't know why you would think that, or somebody tell you that. Uh, John, like, have you heard any different? I don't have enough data on that to answer the question properly. Uh, I've never seen it, actually, in my time. Mm. So uh, it it quite possibly is true, but I can't. I don't know. Right. Uh, and it may be irrelevant. You can going in a different direction where it won't matter. Um, it sounds like Valentina, you were saying that this 
is a predisposition to be obsessed and it may be influencing the way you behave and the way he behaves, but I don't think so. I think what's happening is you are showing uh, communications characteristics and he's saying, oh, poor Valentina, I'll help her. This, of course, infantilizes you. It makes you feel small. You don't like it, but you also understand that he has the best of intentions. Mm. And that's true. He has the best of intentions, but the relationship as it stands is not sustainable. You cannot grow with someone who treats as a, as a partner, with someone who treats you as a child because you're not the child. However, the thing can the thing can work if you establish some clear cut communications routine. In other words, you can tell him you're not a child, you don't need to be taken care of. But you can also teach him ways of talking to you that don't create problems. I'll give you an example. Sometimes if you're differently wired, your your boyfriend says, Oh, let's go to that Brazilian place. Or would you want to have Chinese? Oh, what about Indian or Mandarin? Or, you know, something. And he gives you like five choices. Um, maybe that's a bit overwhelming because you start, you know, you start upset. Okay, he likes and, and it makes a confusion. So if that's the case, you could say, listen, if you're going to invite me to dinner, say, Valentina, I'd like us to go to dinner. Let's go to that Italian place. And then you have, haven't got a whole mess of communications to deal with. That may not be a great example for everybody, but what I'm saying is uh, sometimes people can ask questions in such a way that they create problems. Give you too many choices or inquire too closely after how good you are or how well you feel. So, so you can say, oh, uh, let's do this. Oh, are you all right? Are you sure you're all right? Are you really sure? That can make you crazy because it's very insulting because they haven't respected you. So uh, uh, another kind of communication strategy is you can say to your partner who's over, look, if I say something to you, I mean it. Then we yeah. go. Don't keep going. Don't keep asking me if I'm sure I mean it. <laughs> right? Yeah. Are you sure you mean that? You really mean it? That? that makes well, most people are crazy, but if you're differently wired, it can send you around the bin. What does this mean? He means what I'm, you know. So it, clarity from your partner is respectful. So there's a few things like that. Now, I don't know all the ways you're going to he talk, but um, if he says, I must help you do something to enter this conversation, you can tell him, no, you don't need to. Okay? Hmm. Just leave it. The other thing is, you can develop some communication strategies which might be very helpful for you, shortcuts. When he's being, say, inquisitive about something, oh, can you answer me now? You can say something like, I need a minute, uh, I'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. Just give yourself space and don't commit to any answer. I'll, no, don't worry, I'll get back to you. Don't keep tormenting me about it, I will answer you, but give me time, I gotta mull a few things over. So a few things like that will help improve the communication. As I say, I reiterate, that exact situation you're in now, no matter how kind he is and other things working, is not sustainable because it will never allow you um, to, to do, you know, to be the person you are. And if you don't have a depend, if you don't think you have a dependence on, on him, then that's probably quite true. Mm. You just need to uh, sort of by elucidating the way that you feel and by taking those uh, little opportunities for agency and self-sufficiency, um, you can make it quite obvious and you, you know you can fulfill, fulfill your belief that you aren't dependent on him. Um, and just also, of course, you know, it sort of should go without saying, but you know, sometimes we need to be reminded of it, that when you're in a relationship, just make sure that you're telling each other these things. That way... And but also, especially if you're differently wired, make sure that you have a sort of a policy that you're always direct with each other about things that you're not, that you're always honest, you're not holding anything back. If you say you're feeling a certain way, you say that, uh, that way everything's out in the open and that way problems that are there, they can be dealt with efficiently. Um, 
there's Emerald Queen makes an, an, a lovely comment to add to what we've been talking about. Uh, I have a rule with my mom that she has to wait for me to answer one question before she asks another so I don't get overwhelmed. That's a great rule mm. and a very good point. Because you can say, do you want this for dinner or do you want that? Well, automatically, you've got two squared things you can deal with. Mm. And so you can't answer the first question. So if people blast you with a pile of questions or a series of questions, what they've done is they've hijacked your ability to answer any questions. So you end up feeling bad because you can't say anything. Yeah, exactly. And then it's just like, it becomes a whole different other thing from the thing that you wanted to uh, address in the first place. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, one final thing I just want to say, like in respect to just being direct and trying to simplify things, uh, just maybe it might benefit you to tell your uh, partner that, you know, you would like to have some like establish more agency because you do feel like you're being looked after too much and you don't want that to be the case. And then just uh, say, okay, try to allow me to, try and be equal to you in this relationship where I'm making some of the decisions. I'm, uh, you know, taking control of my emotions. So that way you don't have to feel like you're constantly looking after me. Just be direct about that. I think you'll find that things uh, work out a little bit better that way. Okay. Uh, so that's all the mailbag questions that we have for today. Thank you so much to Valentina, Chuck, and Darth Eskar for sending those in. Um, so... Let's just jump right into the main topic that we established uh, for this week. If I can find the graphic for it, there it is. How to be fun. This one was recommended to us by one of my, I, I think, yeah, one of the members of the support squadron, Enning Maniac, a guy who's been around on my channel for a very, very long time. Thank you so much for suggesting that, Enning Maniac. And sorry for taking so long to get to it. You know, it's just when uh, I originally asked for a whole bunch of different topics, a whole bunch of people suggested them. So we're just finally getting towards the end. Um, necro necrotoxin. That's uh, Elisa. She's saying Max is teaching us how to be fun. Yeah, I mean, you talk to me for, like pretty much every day. I, I must be because I have a, a charming personality, and uh, you know, nobody, nobody feel the need to refute that in the chat. You know, it should be self evident. Um, yeah, but how to be fun? Obviously, when you are differently wired and. You have a hard time picking up on uh, social cues, body language. Uh, sometimes you act in a certain way, and a lot of the times people don't respond in the way that you would like. It can be somewhat daunting uh, to even attempt to figure out ways to try to be fun because it just seems like such an impossibility. But I can assure you, as somebody that is uh, differently wired, I have found different ways to uh, appear to be fun. Well, appear to be fun. I am. Okay. I can't. I am actually fun. Sorry. Uh, I gotta, I'd be, I gotta use more active verbs and uh, adjectives here. Um, I will give some of my own personal methods in a second in regards to how to be fun. Um, but before I do, I just like, I feel like I've been taking up a, a lot of the show already. So I just want to uh, ask John. Uh, you know, I usually ask him this, but it's relevant. Um, in regards to like your clients, have they expressed to you like, oh, I, I don't know how to socialize with people. I don't know how to be interesting or attractive. Like how often is that a thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've got lots of clients who have given up trying to socialize altogether because everything seems to go sideways and avoidance is, is a primary technique. So this is not unusual at all because the world can be so unfriendly when you're when you're not marching to the rhythm of all the social mores that you don't even know about. Mm. Uh, in fact, you might go to a place and they want you to do a pile of stuff. Uh, you know, like dance to this music, do this this way, or let's all sing this song together. And you say, well, I don't really want to. Somebody's like, well, you're no fun. And you're not fitting in. So it's very like Death of Scar's point before. You're not fitting in because you're not fun. But again, I'm going to go back to the same principle it has to be fun for you to be for yeah you to for fun for you to be fun it has to be fun for you if you're if you're trying to um if you're trying to figure out what other people are doing and copying them so you can seem you're having fun this is really tricky and it's never gonna really unless you're more an actor or actress or something like that Mm -hmm. So if, if fun for you 
is, um, you know, playing the tuba, then find other people who, who like playing the tuba. You know, it, it's the same fit thing. But you know, you go to you know, you go to I don't know Rome on a party, and uh, you know, somebody says, "Oh, you must have had fun last night because you drank six tequilas and you disappeared with that woman for a long time." Then you went to the fountain, and do you know they had to clean out the fountain? You must have had some fun, but don't worry. I had my camera going all the time. Was that fun? <laughs> John, it sounds like you're speaking from personal experience. You want to tell us about no, that? No, no, I'm, imagi- I'm imagining everything. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Um, sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought because I was just I found that that story so amusing. Um, yeah, my, my form of fun is. Uh, playing the tuba but when i'm walking behind extremely overweight people they don't enjoy it (laughs) oh we're going to be in trouble again i think yeah Uh, i didn't mean that uh youtube monetization people i wasn't making fun of certain groups come on family guy did it give me a break uh lady pain says max is my kind of fun yeah i'm my i'm mine kind of fun too i I, (laughs) yeah um so anyways yeah, it can be quite difficult from time to time, but it, it sort of goes back to what we were talking about before. It's like, how can you be fun if you yourself aren't in a place where you're having fun? You can't, when you're trying to please others, you can't always do it from a place of desperation or where you feel like everybody else is miserable and it's on you to uh, try to lighten the mood. Because, uh, you know, because in those cases, you're probably not at your best. If you're having you're making fun, me, you know what? You're making me think of a long time ago, I don't know, 25 or 30 years, I, some guests were visiting. We went to this comedian show and uh, at Yuck Yucks. Oh, yes. Somewhere yes. in Toronto, right? And this guy got on the stage who had prepared a bunch of jokes that weren't fun. They were not funny. Mm-hmm. So he started uh, his, with his jokes and he laced them with a lot of profanities. So he thought they'd be more funny but they were more like disgusting than funny. Mm -hmm. So people didn't laugh. So then he would make the jokes more disgusting and more loud. And then he started to like shine and then he started to sweat and then he would say more and more. And then he would say, golly, you guys are, I don't know. And you could watch him falling apart because he was trying to fit in in some way. I don't know. That wasn't fun. (laughs) But you know, desperation can happen if you're trying to if you're trying to be fun when you're not actually doing what you want to be doing. Or yeah, you know, I think here a, a great word to look at is authentic. You know, mm-hmm. if if you're authentic in your uh, your plans and you find people that like doing the kinds of things you do or same sorts of interests or sports or games or hobbies or whatever they happen to be, that's real fun and that fun can be really weird to another person. It might be quiet. It might not be jumping around, clapping and cheering and wiggling your arms or whatever. It might be something that's sedentary. It might be something that's intellectual. You know, uh, to me, if, you know, if Jordan Peterson makes it back in good shape and said, let's do coffee, that would be fabulous fun. Just to talk to this guy, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're speaking as if you know him. I, I want to be there if you happen to uh, mm. go to meet him for coffee. But uh, yeah, what was I about to say? Thinking about that that fountain in Rome, right? Yeah, sorry. It's just uh, unfortunately, guys. If I seem like all over the place today, it's just that my ADHD is acting up. I hope you'll understand. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, anyways, I'll just. Uh, because I'm just having a hard time paying attention. It, you know, it's just there's sometimes, as I'm sure a lot of you know, when you have ADHD, uh, your mind just is just skipping all over the place so you can't string things together as cohesively as you can. Um, but yeah, so I'll just uh, sort of give, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my ways that I, I found uh, have worked for me in terms of trying to be fun. So, you know, if you're on the autism spectrum like me, you might think that you're naturally predisposed to never being fun because, you know, you have the monotone voice. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the awkward body language. Uh, you tend to go on about things that nobody else seems to care about. Well, what I found is that because I do tend to speak in this matter of fact, 
a semi monotone tone of voice, I, I found a way to use that to my advantage. And, uh, and let me explain how you can do this and you can use it as a way to be comedic and lighthearted and people will want to be around you. So um, I've mentioned a comedian on the show before, I believe his name is Stephen Wright. Uh, John, you know who he is? You keep asking me that and I keep forgetting. Oh. Is that Ron? <laughs> is that, is that, sorry, did you just say, is that Ron? Is that wrong? Oh no. It's, you know, the opposite of right. I get it. Stephen wrong. <laughs> uh, I thought I was the king of dad jokes. Uh, anyway. Oh no, I can kill any joke. <laughs> it's over. Make it roll over, play dead, and not even know the difference. Hmm. Uh, um. Yeah, but sorry, Stephen Wright. Uh, he's a he's a comedian that tends to speak in a very deep, um, matter of fact way, and he just says the most ridiculous stuff while he's saying it. Like uh, one of the 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 joke that I told at the very beginning of the show about you know Miles Davis and Kilometer Davis that was uh, his joke, but he obviously sounds a whole lot better when he says it. Like what what are some of his jokes? He's like, when I was a little kid, I wish the first word I ever said was the word quote. So right before I died, I could say end quote. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I looked out the window and I said, oh, my God, I can't believe it. It always snows on my birthday. And my friend who I was with, he said, today's your birthday? And I said, no. I just wanted to prove the primitive linear thinking you would have by taking those two facts and coming to that conclusion. <laughs> Anyways. But, yeah, um, thankfully, my dad, he introduced me to Stephen Wright when I was a kid. And I immediately identified with his type of comedy. And I found that when I told the, like jokes kind of like his, where he says these ridiculous things, but he says it as if they really happened in this matter of fact way. I could use it as a way to uh, be fun to other people. Um, So I, you know, I would sometimes just tell his jokes and people would find them hilarious Um, other times, uh, but other times, unfortunately, but, but I'll explain how this unfortunately thing became a fortunate thing in a second. But sometimes, unfortunately, when I tell these jokes, people tend to think that I was actually being serious you know, like, uh, especially when you're younger and, you know, some of the kids that you're around don't tend to get jokes like that. They might actually think that you're being serious and you're just being weird. So uh, what I uh, when I realized that I, I started to de- started to develop my own form of comedy uh, a little bit later on where I can uh, just amuse myself. And I would tell these uh, ridiculous stories to uh, people and see how many uh, of them would believe me. And I just amused myself by the fact that they actually believed them. So I'll give you an example. When I was in grade 12, uh, no, when I was in grade 11, I took grade 12 law. And uh, during one of our classes, uh, we were discussing the rights of religious minorities. And naturally, you know, we were put into groups and we were just uh, trying to study this one particular text about what the rights are. And then naturally, because you're around a bunch of teenagers, they start making fun of a bunch of different religions and religious cults. And then I thought, hmm, this is an opportunity for me to sort of uh, to make fun of them, but in my own way. And uh, they started talking about the Jehovah Witnesses. And uh, I just thought it'd be funny if I pretended that I was a, um, sort of related to the Jehovah Witnesses. So when they started making fun of them, I was just like, guys, come on. I really appreciate if you didn't make fun of the Jehovah Witnesses. And then they got all scared. They're like, oh, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Are you a member of the Jehovah Witnesses? I said, "Uh, no, not exactly. I'm sort of a part of a subordinate organization to the Jehovah Witnesses. And I'm like, what do you mean? I said, well, you ever hear of the Jehovah Witness Protection Program? And they're like, no, what is that? It's It's like, well, you know, the Jehovah Witnesses, they go door to door. And sometimes there are people that they're not very friendly towards them and sometimes they get violent sometimes they have a gun so i'm a part of the organization that goes door to door for them so we can protect them and there are like oh, just yeah. Yeah, the way that i just i the way that i said it i suppose they actually believe me and then uh later on i had to tell them that no i'm i'm totally joking um and there are multiple other instances where i did something like that just to be amusing and Thankfully, you know, it was always a decent balance because there are people that actually thought I was serious and I found that funny. But there are other people that knew that I was joking and they laughed. 
So that's one way that you can use uh, your differently wired status uh, to your benefit. You know, just uh, use your matter of fact way of talking as a way of as a form of humor, and that way you can uh, bring people to you that way. So, uh, Excellent. Yeah. Uh, you know, actually, you know, uh, years ago I was in the navy and I lived in Halifax, and we had this apartment, and people came around with little pamphlets and Bibles tucked under their arm, and I had already seen them in the area, and they were knocking on doors and engaging one in conversations. And at the time they came to my house, I was using a grass hook on the backyard. A grass hook? Yeah, it looks like a mini scythe, a very vicious looking weapon you use to swipe at the grass. It's it. Um, oh, it's I, a, I know what you're talking it, about. It's like a saber in reverse, only it's curved. So as I spoke to these people, I gestulated with my grass hook. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't threaten them. I just waved it around a little bit. And, you know, they never came back. <laughs> oh, th- yeah, sure. Yeah, you just happened to have that, you know. I just happened to have it. And it was talking like they... in a friendly way. And this thing was like, you know, two feet of curved, ugly steel mm-hmm. in my hand. Anyway, yeah, the, uh, part, the part of the story that of, John seems to be uh, overlooking for the sake of uh, the show is the fact that they came to his door 10 times and, uh, you know, he actually did threaten <laughs> them. And then there was a whole oh, lawsuit no. and everything. And he's just trying to clear his name. So how did you know all that? John, Holy cow. it's called the can't Internet. Keep a secret. OK, everybody can look uh, it up. Look, there, there's some beautiful comments and stuff being made in the chat right now that bear right on what we're saying. Um, mm. Hi, uh, Nick. Hi, Nick. Hi, Lady Perry. Yeah. Look, Kovlad says, I was born with a rather strange bone deformation. So every time someone asks me about it, I would tell them my sister punched me when I was a baby. (laughs) Fantastic. (laughs) Yes. Beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. Mm. That is good at so many levels. It normalizes the conversation. It makes you laugh. It makes them laugh. Or it makes them feel stupid. Whatever it needs to do for them, it does it. And it relieves you of a complicated nonsense information, which, of course, is not really any of their business anyway, but it's a great answer. Yeah, you find a way to use uh, these things to your benefit. Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah, a, it's a, it's a oh, great... oh, man, there, there's this trend, uh, like, you could probably, do you guys remember Vine? Like, I, John, you probably never heard of it, but uh, there was you say this... Wine? No, Vine, like a, like oh. a Vine in the, in the jungle. Um, oh. what, do you, do you remember Vine? Vine? No, I drank so much one time that I completely forgot about what wine was. Um, no, Vine, it's like, a, it's sort of like what TikTok is right now, where you can use this app on your phone and record a seven second video just to show everybody, hey, this is what's going on in my neck of the woods. And uh, there are these vines that people used to post. Um, people that were born physically deformed, they would have no legs and maybe only one arm. And they would... <laughs> they would... Sorry, this sounds bad before I say it, but it's not bad because they're they're making um, uh, positive use of it. They would go to the grocery store and uh, they would sneak up on people just crawling on the ground and going like, ah, like something out of a horror movie and scare the crap out of them. (laughs) It's amazing. You can look this up. It's absolutely hilarious. Oh, and uh, one other thing I wanted to say in response to, because this reminded me of something that I like to do when uh, people come to my door, call me on the phone, and I, I uh, don't want, I don't desire their presence. Um, sometimes when like telemarketers call me on the phone, um, you know, obviously nobody likes telemarketers. So, uh, but I, I use it as a way, like a, a way to amuse myself. So, uh, and this is a Stephen Wright joke. Before I, I say it, but it. it it, it's funny to me. So they, they try to sell me the product, be it like a vacuum or printer toner or uh, nuclear weapons. And they would, uh, you know, <laughs> they would um, say, uh, can we uh, expect you to uh, buy our product today? And I'd say, well, you know what? That all sounds fantastic. But I just have to ask you one question before I can consider purchasing your product. If you're in a vehicle and you're traveling at the speed of light and you turn your lights on, would they do anything? <laughs> and then regardless of whether or not they answered yes, no, or I don't know, 
I would just say in response, well, fine, then I don't want to buy your product. And then I just hang up on them. I love that. No, I would tell you, I'm having a race with the speed of light. <laughs> <laughs> it's a parallel universe. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I tried to I tried to make it sorry that they ever called me. It's just like oh, uh, yeah. There, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I got a, you know, a squirrel came into our uh, into our house and he jumped on the stove and lit on fire. So I got to go get the fire extinguisher. I'll, uh, can you please call me back later? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's wonderful because what you're saying here, Max, is that you take something that's a perceived deficiency, like Kovlet said, or something, and you make light of it. You make a story. You have a line for it. So I'm thinking... If you're differently wired and you have uh, trouble being fun, you can develop a certain set of comments or stories about something you're interested in. You can say, like Kovla did with the uh, the sister punchman. Mm. But he doesn't have to memorize that anymore. It's in his DNA now. He can say that whenever that topic comes up and people will find it funny or they're not. And if they don't find it funny, well, then what up? Who cares? Yeah. So uh, it... it it helps to develop something. If you're really short or tall or green or blue or you're something, you can have a line that's developed. You can learn it. You can have it ready to go. So, and it can be funny. It can be lighthearted, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that will sort of help this whole issue of like desk arrays with fitting in and being fun because you can make light of something that could otherwise be viewed as, as a terrible problem or a tragedy or something. Mm-hmm. although i will say it's actually, what it's, it's actually very healthy to do that mm-hmm. although i will say what isn't healthy is that if you actually were born blue and you're not sonic the hedgehog and or violet from willy wonka and the chocolate factory you might want to get that looked at um we just got another beautiful one from lawful fay i sometimes introduce myself by saying hi i'm amy the a is for autism <laughs> i love that <laughs> Call 1-800-DOCTOR. The B is for bargain. Uh, that just reminded me of that line from uh, The Simpsons. Uh, that, 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 that's good, Lawful Faye. Um, it is really good, yeah. yeah. So It's good, and it, 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 it brings up your spirit to have something like that in your toolbox that can turn a, a conversation that's nasty into something that's kind of easy, kind of goes away, mm-hmm. kind of makes people smile. Cop and light. the time is oh I gotta head off. Okay, yeah, I'll 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 finish up the show. Thanks as always, John. Well, Max, I must say this has been fun. Thank yes, you very this much. has been fun. <laughs> uh, a little bit reve- uh, you know, a little bit maybe too revealing, but fun nonetheless. Uh, I'll talk to you later, John. I'll finish off the show. Oh, he's gone. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just want to address uh, Kovlad. He said when people ask me what's up, I just look up at the ceiling. I am a true comedian. When people ask me what's up, I say airplane food. Um, yeah, it's not that good, but you know, whatever. I, I, like I said, I, I am the king of dad jokes, even though I am not, in fact, a dad. Um, listen, guys, we have come to the end of the show. Thank you so much, as always, for tuning in. Listen, before you tune out, I just want to say, you know, I'm really glad that you guys are liking the stream without me having to tell you. But uh, just, just in case you haven't liked the stream yet, please consider doing so. It's really easy. It's free. And when you do so, it tells the YouTube algorithm that the content on this channel is worth watching. Not just this video, but when you hit the like button on this video, it encourages the YouTube algorithm to pass around other videos on my channel. And who knows, maybe there might be somebody out there that is dealing with some stuff in regards to mental illness or autism and they might need some support while this video might pop up in the recommended feed and they might get it right at the time that they need it the most so please hit that like button um and i just want to uh i think there was one other thing oh yeah obviously we do have an after show uh for the differently wired show you can gain access to the after show by supporting me on Subscribestar. Uh, Subscribestar is like Patreon. It's just without the unethical business practices. If you want to figure out how to be a part of the after show, it's really easy. Um, All you have to do is just go to the Subscribestar link and you can figure out how to do that right there. Uh, But you know what? Because uh, I didn't actually explain that at the beginning of the show, uh, I'm actually going to uh, actually join the public... uh, general chat in my discord server just to talk with you guys and i I do that from time to time you know just so 
I, I like to give the people that do support me by joining the server some of my time. Uh, most of the time it is just uh, exclusive, but I will be in the public chat. Mostly because I, uh, as you might, like I said before, I am kind of all over the place and I'd like to have a whole bunch of other people do the, the talking for me and sort of direct the conversation because I'm all over the place. So, um, yeah, that'll do it for the show. Expect, uh, hopefully, the Joker video to be released tomorrow. That is, if I can get Warner Brothers to stop copywriting me. Uh, but until then, I just want to remind you guys, as always, just remember to stay yellow.